South Durban is an old colonial apartheid created dormitory town. When one says dormitory town, the apartheid and colonial government, the British colonial government, purposely put black residents next to industrial areas for labour. So you have people in proximity to industry. There are more than 300 industries in the area. You have two oil refineries, two paper mills, you have paint companies, chemical companies, you have plastic companies, and then you also have this massive chemical storage area on the northern side. So the residents in South Durban are, are in a valley and they're stuck between and amongst these industries. It is a nightmare. It's an industrial, sociological, ecological nightmare. And we had hoped that uh, post-apartheid, that government would see things differently and, and, and plan things differently. Environmentalism in South Durban and environmental justice activism in South Durban had already appeared in the early 90s. Mere Bank and the Bluff, people were talking about environmental issues. We had been fighting pollution all along, uh, even though the apartheid government was saying that, well, you can't bite the hand that feeds you. These industries are bringing jobs to make sure that there's food on the table, so you can't fight these people. But on the hand side, we realized that they were actually being paid by this polluting industry to defend them. The 1994 engine called the first Community Awareness and Emergency Response Meeting, which we call a care meeting. And they called everybody in around November, December to start talking. Talking about talking. And then in February, suddenly they said, oh, by the way, Mandela's coming next month. Would you like to sit around the table with Mandela? So the communities immediately understood, and these were communities from Bluff, Wentworth, Mirbank, immediately understood why NGEN was actually calling them to a meeting, feeding them prawns, feeding them fancy suppers, because they wanted them at the table when Mandela came. The community said, no way. If you want us around the table when Mandela comes, these are our demands. And on the 17th of March, they put to NGEN a series of demands. And one of those demands was that there will be an 80% reduction in pollution immediately. Engine scoffed, looked at us and said, no way. So on the 25th of March, when Mandela came, we then collected uh, ourselves and we went on protest. We wanted to touch on Mandela's conscience uh, and bring it to his attention that um, our children were dying of leukemia and asthma and cancer, and that these polluting industries were responsible for it. He came driving past, and um, I'll never forget because he stopped his car but his security people continued to the gate of engine and he just got out. By then the security people were running back and he got out and he started shaking people's hands. And we told him that uh, you are visiting the enemy of the people. Uh, these people are polluting us, they're causing us to get sick and we explained everything. He addressed the people with a megaphone uh, to the dismay of both the engine officials and the, and the police. Um, and he basically said, uh, this is terrible under our, our new uh, majority rule government. You should not have your children, with uh, many with asthma, and the adults, many with cancer. Uh, we really need to give attention to this, and we will. We realized that that was our only opportunity that we were ever going to have to be able to push this thing at a national level and to get somebody powerful to be able to understand what is going on. And on the 28th of March, a couple of days later, he brought the Minister of Energy down, the Minister of Health, the Minister of Environment, and we all sat around the table. The South Durban communities, separate still, not as Setsi, but as Bluff, Mirbank, Wentworth. Mandela, Bantu Holomisa, as well as Peak Botha, uh, together with Engine. And we had a whole day discussion, and it was clear that we were at war with these people, but because of Mandela, he tried to actually mediate and bring us together. And Mandela said to Bantola Misu, who was then the Deputy Minister of Environment, I hand it over to you, find a solution to this problem in South Durban. 
For the first time, industries were forced to talk to communities. Before that, nobody can, can find out what is happening inside those, those walls. We're shielded by government policies. And Mandela broke that and he said, you will come and talk to the communities and listen to them. And going forward, now you'll address all of the concerns. So we then went on a big drive, government, industry and communities, and set up a big process to start looking at the industrial problems in South Durban. But there was no solution to it because the industry refused to do anything, government wasn't strong enough, and the communities were not united enough. In November 1995, we pulled all the people from Isipingo, Omalazi, Mirbank, Bluff, Wentworth, Earthlife Africa, uh, was one of the NGOs, even West, the Wildlife Environmental Society of South Africa was there in the beginning. And we met at Diconia, and around the walls, I'll never forget, we put up the, the press stories of all the environmental issues over that year. And we said, look at it, look at guys, look at all these problems around us. Are we gonna continue being as individual communities or are we gonna gather and collect our forces? There were memorable individuals from the, each of the different communities and in, in that respect, they, they came with energy, they came with hope, they came wanting to connect. And they recognised that together they were stronger than alone. We had people from all race groups and from all the different areas in South Durban coming together over one issue, which, which was really important to all of us. We took a decision at that meeting to form the South Durban Community Environmental Alliance so we could speak as one voice whenever we speak to industry and government so that we can bring all our common resources to bear on our common problems. Because we had common problems and that was pollution and we had common resources and that was people's energy and willingness to resist the onslaught of this pollution. I mean, CEDC took a life of its own. All we did was help facilitate and get people talking. And then once people started talking, we couldn't stop it. It, it was a, and it hasn't stopped since then. The polluting industry had one positive thing that it did. It united the Wentworth community, the Miaben community, or colored the Indian and the whites, because the fight was one fight. All around the country, there was this emergence of, of people of different colors coming together around environmental issues. But you know, only Setsi, 22 years later, is standing. And that is for me amazing, that in South Durban, 22 years later, that's the only multicultural group that has maintained over 22 years. The first thing that stands out is the leadership, Des and Bobby and, and all of the community leaders that give up a huge amount of time. For them to be visible and for them to, to have voice, that's probably one twentieth of the time that they spend. It's going to meet with people, going to listen to complaints, going to talk to people on the ground, because that's where they get their legitimacy. Fighting for people is about walking the talk. And so when you walk around the community and you talk to people, there's a vast amount of knowledge out there that you can capture and use that. Desmond doesn't give up. And he was determined to take on the giants. In the beginning, Desmond worked for nothing. He had been fired. On the 28th of December, 1998, while I was on holiday, I received a telegram from the company. Somebody dismissed and I thought, wow, and I celebrated because I knew now, now I'm going to turn this around. When you start off and you see the atrocities, you realize that this thing is such low down in the government's agenda and people are dying and yet nobody's doing anything about it. And I thought, no way, under my watch will that be allowed. You are to leave your premises immediately and proceed along Bluff Road to Lighthouse Road. A lot of people was running from inside. Even then I took a vow. Firstly, I took a vow never to compromise. Second thing I took a vow was that they'll not take the polluting industry's money. Also made a vow that the chemical and petrochemical industry will never be left alone again. That I will be a real watchdog to watch them day and night. Well, what we've been calling for 
was that these companies must be held accountable. How long must we continue to live in an uncertainty? How long must our people not sleep at night? How long must our children be dying of cancer and leukemia and asthma and the city forefathers who are supposed to be the protectors and custodians of our health and well-being are not doing nothing, are standing by and not doing absolutely nothing against these companies. I think Setsi's strength is its ability to respond immediately. It's not going to wait and say, next month we'll have a meeting. Listen, there's a pipe leaking and it's, 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 it's a sewer system that's dumping water into a river or into the cuttings beach. Setsi is right there. A press release is on. So if I got a call at 2 o'clock when they were exploding, I was out there at 2 o'clock in the morning with a camera in the bucket, taking our own air sample, videotaping them, taking photos of them. What I've observed is that you need uh, social pressure uh, backed up by a good scientific data to bring about change. And this is what SETSI has achieved. I mean, the most important campaign for me in, in South Durban was nobody knew what we were breathing, what air we were breathing in South Durban. We knew it was polluted. I couldn't live in South Durban. I was sent off to boarding school at a young age. We knew the air was dirty. We knew the dirty air was coming from engine. Engine and government would not tell us what we were breathing in. And then in 2000, together with Communities for Better Environment, Groundwork, and the South African Exchange Program on Environmental Justice based out of Boston, we did air samples, our own bucket brigade air samples in South Durban. And we found benzene, toluene, xylene in our air samples. So for the first time, for the first time, the South African public knew what we were breathing in. Because before that, all that information was hidden from us. And as a result of that, there was investigative journalism undertaken by Tony Carney, and we found that we have cancer clusters in South Durban. Leukemia rates were 64 times higher than the national norm. And what is leukemia linked to? Benzene. Like asbestosis is linked to asbestos, leukemia is linked to benzene. We took charge of our own science, and taking charge of our own science meant we could take charge of our own advocacy and our own political direction. I think the major, the major success which has got us international recognition is the closing of the Bulbul landfill site. But it's also made the, uh, the waste companies fear me. Never did I ever dream I'll close three landfill sites. The engine and shell oil refinery had to change all the oil pipelines that travel through our community. We exposed their lies. That was ph phenomenal, to expose the lies of corporations. When everybody else was against us and government was in support of Shell, and they went behind closed doors and cut deals, we as a community went internationally and we linked up and we, we got them to accept that their pipelines are rotten. We got them to reduce their pollution, you know, in South Durban. Through South Durban, government set up the first government monitoring system that was used as a basis for our 2004 Air Quality Act. SETSI made sure that the um, proposals that we had put, the findings that we had come up with, remained at the forefront in their ongoing struggles to reduce the air pollution in those communities. <laughs> You are a pain in the neck for the polluting industry. That one I like. I'm thrilled about it because when they, they plan generating profit, before they do that, they plan how to deal with SC before they plan how to make profit. And that one is a very nice one. The success is that everybody in South Durban, if they have a pollution problem now, phone sets it. You know, that's, that's, that's success. That's movement success. Stopping the traffic at the harbour was, was a very big thing. Um, we were very organised, um, thanks to Des. We had all had these wonderful red t-shirts on. And we'd stopped the traffic and we were walking up and down and talking to the truck drivers. They were getting very, very irate. So we were spreading the gospel to the truck drivers and telling them what it was all about. But then there was a perfect moment when Des said, OK, at this moment, it's time for us to just fill this whole intersection. And that's what we did. We sat down on, on, on the middle of the road with these enormous trucks on four sides all around us. And that, that was quite a profound moment because you felt vulnerable as a human being, but you felt really strong because you had your identity as part of Setsi. I think the critical thing with Setsi now is that it's a movement. It is, it's not an organisation. And that's what gives Setsi its strength. 
The fisher folk are at the table. The farmers are at the table. The hostel dwellers are at the table. The unemployed people from Amlazi are at the table. People fighting for housing. People fighting for open spaces. Setsi is the go-to organization. It's the go-to movement when people have problems. Once you come here at Set's office, you never go out without of any assistance. When you move out from here, you know what I'm going to do outside. You know what I'm going to do in, in, in my communities. Setsi has been our voice. And it wasn't for Desmond, then we, we wouldn't have been on this farm because nobody wants to know, you know, we are just another farmer. To them, to the airport company we, and to the Transnet, we are just another farmer. But with Desmond and Setsi behind our back, we are powerful. We will stand there and we know that we will go on fighting as long as Setsi fights for us. I think for now, in, in, in our current circumstances, uh, accountability of government to the people is a very complex set of, of negotiations and it's only through organising and, and building voice that communities like South Durban can be heard. But without without said here and without that kind of organising, um, they would have been trampled over long, long, long ago. Um, and I think that's just an incredible legacy of 21 years of, of leadership and organising. We're sitting here in Michigan, in the United States, the day before our presidential election. And I would like to really say that what SEDSI does has impacts beyond Africa. Activists here get inspiration from people in Africa. And also some of the work happens in a global context. Companies are not active in just one part of the world. And the governments uh, are having to make international agreements as much as most of them don't want to. So we really need each other. Research trends suggest that poverty is going to increase, inequality is going to increase. There will be more focus on, on, on supporting and promoting big business at the expense of the poor. And hence I see uh, the need for a stronger SETSI, a bigger SETSI, and my dream would be to have 10 Des Desa operating in Devon. We need to look at how do we train future leaders, who do we hand the batons over to, to ensure that the same ethics and values and visions is ongoing because you're not building for now. The environmental struggles are long term. If we want to change the international policies in the UN and the government's policies in South Africa and the continent, then we need to make sure that the young people are in the forefront of it all. Because if they become stewardships of the earth, we'll have a better environment.